UK Crime Book Club. We are live. Summer Crime Fest, as you can see. Woo! Yep. <laughs> Except lovely James sitting in his jumper up in Scotland. We have a sea heart. It's coming. <laughs> and Chris, you're doing okay as well. Yeah. Just me sea and breeze. Have had I have a sea breeze, so I'm all right. No, we have had enough. I, I like oh, it. I'm so excited. It's very for this. useful up there. <laughs> Um, right, let's start with you, Tina. Oh. Tell us who you are, what your books are, and how. Well, I'm sitting in London. Yeah, my living room is a temperature of the sun's surface at the minute. Um, I am the author of a couple of psychological noir, domestic noir thrillers. Call me Mummy, and uh, the hardback of Nasty Little Cuts. I have to be very careful how you say that's out now on the paper that's coming out next month. And my third one, they're all with Viper books. The third one, I'm just about to go into a copy edit. I'm sorry, James, have I offended you already by the title of my book? I thought you were going. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. Not at all. Your, your pronunciation was, was fabulous. Chris. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Uh, right, yes, I write domestic, noir-ish, gothic-y, I think. Uh, so I've written, uh, oops, got one down the wrong way. Uh, five, oh, sorry, I've written seven actually, but five uh, published. Um, that's those. One, the last one, the most recent one was uh, The Guest House, which was under my pseudonym, Abby Frost. Uh, but the new one, first sight here, which is not out yet, but I've got a bound copy. So it's called When the Lights Go Out. And so that's my next one. That's out in December. But it's available to pre order now. <laughs> pre order. Pre order. Or on NetGalley if you want to get on there and have an early read. That's that. James. Yes, right. Okay. Well, I. I have got six books here. Um, they're not all domestic noir. Uh, I have written a series, a historical series set in 1920 uh, or thereabouts, uh, which is featuring Inspector Blades. And uh, it's set, they're set just after the First World War so that you have uh, all the, the trauma of the First World War and which people have gone through and which they're recovering from, and how has that affected them? And people are um, seeking redemption, trying to recover from their PTSD, and of course, the Spanish flu then as well. Uh, so, you know, they had a double whammy. They, they had a, a war and they had a, had a, a pandemic. So it must have been nice. Uh, so anyway, I put my characters through some difficult situations, as you'll realise. But these are noir, just noir. So what I've done is I've sort of taken, you know, it, there's still crimes, there's still a police investigation, but I've sort of done them from the point of view of the characters who are, who are involved in having the crime done to them or in, involved in it somehow or other. And uh, they're both, these are both set in Sunny Nairn and they are uh, which is where I live in the Highlands near Inverness. And uh, one is called Burning Suspicion, which is, uh, as you can see, there's a house fire and uh, a family is involved in that. And uh, there are repercussions from the fires of police investigation and the fault lines in the family are uncovered through the investigation and the, the way they have to deal with the situation afterwards. And where Wolves Pearl is my newest one, it's the one I'm pushing, if I'm, if I'm pushing things. Uh, uh, where Wolves Pearl, and there's about a young man who comes to Sunny Nairn, and uh, where Wolves Pearl, that's what locals are all like. And um, eh, no, they're not, but the, the ones in this book are. <laughs> uh, so he, he has. Uh, a, a, in a sense, he's a has a fractured personality because he has he's recovering from accidentally killing someone and he's escaped to near from that where he finds himself in a fractured situation where there's a murder 
and he finds himself caught up in the investigation. And because he's actually killed someone in the past, you sort of look into him. Yeah, you don't leave poor Jason alone. No, you know. <laughs> Guy can't it's... catch a break. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about day jobs and things that you've done and if they have been a help in, um, in writing your books. So, Tina, let's start with you. Well, at the minute when I'm not writing to avoid deep vein thrombosis, I teach Keep Fit. Um, and in uh, Nasty Little Cuts, the lead protagonist who's in a very toxic relationship is a Keep Fit instructor because I wanted the idea of that to be a woman fighting for her life, but somebody who's quite strong and not a victim. And... and to be honest, there is a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder on both sides, the husband and the wife. But also, um, in the distant past, I used to be an agony aunt. I hosted a satellite television show called The Agony Hour, and I used to edit the problem page for Dr. Miriam Stoppard. So a lot of the sort of issues I knew from being a journalist and you know answering the problem page. Um, and that has helped a lot. And I think actually being a journalist as well, for many years I watched the soaps and sat on the Rain Kelly sofa and thought about Coronation Street. And that has helped because that to me is the start of domestic noir. It's like I didn't see many working class characters in drama when I was growing up. I mean, there, were, there was things like A Taste of Honey, you know, I was a child of the 60s, I remember that. But soaps were the consistent things for me. Uh, Wagoners Walk on the radio, The Archers, and then when we got a telly finally, you know, uh, Coronation Street and later Amadale and EastEnders. So I think every job I've ever had has gone into the books. I think that's how it should be. Chris? Uh, yeah, I've had a few jobs, but um, spent a long while as, as a teacher in primary schools. And of course, well, I saw families in, in so many different sort of situations and heard lots of stories. You know, when you're, um, when you're with the, the children were young, when you're um, seeing the parents regularly, uh, people, they treat you in a way as an agony aunt, you know, like... Um, uh, telling you things perhaps you you ought to know, but also some things you you don't really want to know. Um, so yeah, I mean that I wouldn't obviously use any of their actual stories, but um, it gives you an insight into the variety of ways people live their relationships. Um, so that of course was very useful. I had um, one wonderful job for not very long as a working in a library or working two different libraries actually um, so well that's you know reading i spent i think 18 months i think just reading books that were on the shelves um including lots and lots of crowd books and i've had a, a briefish foray into acting uh which um is obviously is going to you're going to have to try and get yourself into other people's shoes and other people's mindset doing that and of course my latest book i flash again but it did happen to be relevant um is set in uh, a theater group that are working deep in the forest of dean uh which actually i i did experience it, it's partly something that I, I lived through except of course there were no murders that I know of. I was going to say, I'm hoping the <laughs> yeah, experience wasn't quite the same. Yeah, the, the setting's very close to what I experienced. The people are different, but obviously, you know, you, you it feeds in. So, and some of the, the things are very much based on what, what happened to me in, in um, that situation, but not the killings. <laughs> James, or killing. how about I'm you? Not sure Yes, well, I, I also was a teacher, and um, in some ways it was not helpful for writing at all, because uh, certainly I found that as a teacher, that was it. I was a teacher, I had no time to do anything else, so I didn't have the time to write. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I did get one written, but it wasn't any good anyway. But, but after I retired, I started writing novels, 
and um, these are the ones that were published. So that that was nice. Uh, so did the job help me? Well, having having an income afterwards after I'd retired helped me. And uh, yeah, the the you do have a sort of life experience. You have a, you have a, you you have a vicarious experience of other people's lives and teaching. You do learn about how other people live and interrelate and the problems that they have. Um, in, in this book, uh, there is a feature in the book, so um, there are some teaching scenes, so it helped when describing them, of course. Yeah. Um, but I think it's your life experience as much as your, your, your work experience that, that helps you as a writer, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, we must have lots of things that go into it. We seem to have a bit of an echo. Now, I know Kaz had a bit of an issue. So when it comes, if you notice that you're being muted, um, it's just so I can figure out which one of us is echoing and keep them muted. And then we can unmute and mute you as we go on. So let's see if we can figure that out. Hopefully it's not me. <laughs> that will not be helpful. Um, I want to talk about all of the books and the timelines and the way that you have written them. So we've got some that are present, some that are um, present but looking at the past as well and flitting between the two. And why you decided to write them, they're all brilliant, why you decided to write them in the ways that you did. So Tina, let's come back to you first. Well, my mind's a bit chaotic, is the honest truth. I am in awe of people. I mean, I've only recent, I'm quite new to the game, even though I'm very old. Because um, as you say, when you've got a day job, you've not got time to do writing. Um, the Nasty Little Cuts, I wanted it mainly to play over the one night. Uh, I've set it just before Christmas because I honestly believe that that's such a stressful time. So many horrible things have happened to me around that time and it puts everything under stress. And it was written before the pandemic, but then lockdown exacerbated all of that. So the main trajectory is just one night and who's going to, you know, is the husband going to kill the wife? Is the wife going to kill the husband? Are the kids going to survive? But for me, every present moment is a culmination of all the past moments so everything now as i stand here sit here uh in my husband's underpants yet again uh for, i wondered uh, whether you were going to mention that. Ones, please. <laughs> no <flashes>. <laughs> but you know i'm me because of, as as james says all my life experiences and for better or worse, I've had some horrible experiences and vicious relationships with addicts and all sorts. And, you know, my mum was a troubled woman who tried to stab me and I've had horror car crashes. And if you say it like that, just the headlines, it's like, oh, what a weird woman. And I think we're all uniquely weird and scarred. And that comes to my writing much more, as Jane said, than my experience working. And that's how my brain works. And I think it's a bit scattergun. If I read something like a Janice Hallett and it's all so brilliantly plotted, it all comes together. I mean, I know she works really hard doing, you, you know, sort of the appeal and everything, but my brain doesn't work like that. It's a bit more impressionistic. And the way I write is not linear. It's a bit more like a patchwork quilt. And it's terrifying because I don't know if it's going to come together. I've got sort of an end point in mind. But most of my time is actually, this is me in front of the computer with the internal face, which is, you know, all the time. I have no idea what's going to happen. So, yeah, um, I wish I would be able to plot. Apparently, I'm a pantster. And apparently, I'm in a husband pantster. <laughs> I don't know if you've all seen the tweets, but there is an image <laughs> of Tina in her husband's pants on Twitter. The coolest things in the world. <laughs> They're a bit more roomy than anything I possess. <laughs> well, as long as you're comfy. Yeah. No judgment here. Whatever works for you. Might even try it myself. Not your husband's pants, obviously. Chris. <laughs> Let's, let's right. move on. <laughs> I was enjoying that so much, I've kind of forgotten the question, but I'll carry on. Um, it was about the art of the timeline of your book. Oh, yeah, yeah, timeline. But I will say that I, I'm a pantser too, but, but not with a scatter 
shotgun approach, I kind of, um, this, this, it's like I'm telling myself the story. So it, it leads on and on, and I can't move on until I know what happens. <laughs> but um, as far as timelines, I mean, always, again, like Tina, probably like James as well, I think um, you, it, it's always the past impinging on the present. You know, it, it's something that has maybe festered for a while or, or it was a trauma or something in the past that, that, that either come back to haunt uh, people or, you know, is, is there and, and it's got to be worked through. Um, I think two of my books, I mean, it's difficult to remember exactly, but I think two of my two of my books, yes, they, they definitely had um, two timelines. So we actually, I actually showed that past um, and, and what happened as in, as in the, the, the kind of present of the book and then moved forward and back between two timelines. Um, but um, others of them, it's, it's the fact that people are remembering the, the past and the, 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 what they either have tried to get away from or that they've never been able to get away from and they finally have to confront it. That's, that's the kind of thing. But it, it, the past is always terribly important in, in my books. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. James? Well, I, I'm, I'm a philosopher and... Uh, Basically, I, I uh, plot my book from beginning to end and work out what happens in each chapter, and then I don't follow any of any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got the plans, so I've got a direction of travel, and uh, yes, it, it gives me lots of things to draw on when when, when the the story starts to write itself, really, because. I mean, I know it's me rating it, but the story leads itself forward, doesn't it? Your characters. Um, but what, what I do is I take a character and put him into the most difficult situation I can imagine, putting someone in and see what he does, you know. And <laughs> I wouldn't like to be one of my characters, to be honest. It's, no. It's <laughs> anyway, yes, the past does impinge on the present. And, and uh, yes... Uh, certainly in the latest book, particularly, you, you, you have uh, Jason escaping from his past or attempting to, but of course it catches up with him. And, um, uh, but it, the, the, the story is actually linear, linear uh, but, but uh, yes, it does hark back, back to the past as well because it impinges on the present. And uh, he, yes, it's uh, the, the past is what has made him the person that he is in the book because the past situation has basically fractured him. He's, he's become clinically depressed. He's uh, been in a situation where he's wanted to, to jump off the Walter Scott monument if he'd had the courage, which he doesn't. So being afraid of, ashamed of that as well as everything else. Uh, uh, and uh, he considers putting his thumb up and, and just letting the road take him where it will, you know, but, but he doesn't ma actually manage to get up to there and from Edinburgh, which is where he was working in some orderly fashion because he gets a job there. Um, but he leaves everything behind or tries to, but he can't leave this fracture inside him behind. He, he brings that with him. Now I know a bit more about all of you as well. I can kind of see how that's impacted on your books, which is really interesting. They're all quite fresh in my mind. So and we've got lots of hellos. So Dan, Marie, Laura Kaz, um, Donna, JP, Karen McKinley. There's lots and lots. Um, I'm assuming Facebook user is Leslie. But don't like to shoot. Oh no, that's Ben. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> um oh just honestly awful. No, we're not we're not doing great, Ben. Look, right there, feet root. <laughs> but hey ho, it's how we get on with it. JP's watching us while he's typing up notes. Stay cool, all. <laughs> mean. <laughs> um, Karen McKinley, who's actually the storyteller, is right here behind me. Um, and it's fantastic. I recommend everybody reads it. Um, Karen says, Tina, I adored Call Me Mummy and Nasty Little Cuts. Look carefully, carefully. 
<laughs> Both of them had such strong characters and voices. I'm interested in how you develop a character's voice. So I'm going to put that question to all of you. How do you, because all of your characters are very distinctive from each other, for all three of you. So I'm interested to know how, especially seeing as you don't plan or you ignore your plan, or you kind of have a plan, but then go along with it a bit and see how you get on, how that translates to creating such diverse characters. You know, you could pick up a part in any of your books and know which character it is that you're reading, which is not an easy thing to do, as you all know. So, Tina, let's come to you first. I like characters that are not simple, as in they're not goodies, bad is and the pin changes of them. Um, and my first book called Me Mummy, I had a very clear idea in mind that, that the mummy character is the woman who steals a child. Um, her voice came first and it was weird how it came. Um, I was doing my MA in creative writing and they said, go somewhere you've never been before. And I went to mother care. Um, which sounds such a simple thing, and I had a complete emotional breakdown in mother care and asthma attack because I'd tried to have a kid and never had one. And that was the, the seed of the idea was what if a woman took a child who was desperate, but she'd also have to be a real cow because, you know, Eve, I, I've been desperate for a kid by <clears throat> from another person because that's one of the wickedest things that you could do. So what, what would make her do that? And then... To steal, I had that feeling, you know, when you see somebody being not treated very nice, thinking, I could do a better job than that. So the mummy she steals the child from is, you know, the scummy mummy in the tabloid headlines. You know, she smokes while she's pregnant. She's got tattoos. Um, she's very common. She swears. Uh, so, you know, they're fractured bits of, of women I know. And one of the nicest characters in that, I worked at the local Finsbury Park Mosque for a couple of years teaching Keep Fit. So the nice one who's um, Aisha, she comes from that. And then in Nasty Little Cups, I've had several relationships with posh boys in my past. And it's, it's a class thing. What if somebody like me ended up marrying, which I had or gone out with. I once had a date with a lord. So there's me, a window cleaner's daughter, copping off with a lord. I know, it didn't last very long. Because it was like going out with a different species. And that's their relationship, a very working class woman. Um, so there's a scene in that, which is one of my favorite scenes. And he says, you know, what do you like about that rapper? And she says, what rapper? And he says, you're always talking about R. Kelly, that rapper, R. Kelly. And she says, no, it's my sister, R. Kelly. And it's just like that, that to me sort of encapsulates, if you're a working class person, you've got all these cultural references. If like the husband in Nasty Little Cuts, you're an army officer who's gone through, you know, the private schools and, has, has had a completely different background. I got a lot of empathy for him, but he's a different creature and it's never the twain will meet. So I think they're the seeds. And then as James said, you get the characters in, in a situation that's really a pressure cooker and you see how they react and you lean into it and you, you make it more and more extreme. And then they start to speak. I mean, I'm not channeling spirits, but it does feel that a voice starts to come through you. And your job is to try all the words that you can to, mm. to get that voice and relate it and be as emotionally true and honest as possible. Sorry, that was a very long answer. I got that was a great answer. answer. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Chris, talk to us about your characters. Yeah, I think... Um, with me, um, sometimes um, I sort of, I often start with a character actually, uh, and, and, and there might be a voice or a, yes, that, that sort of essence of a character, I don't know about voice, but that, that comes through really vividly to me. I can suddenly, even though sometimes they may not be the main character in the, the book, they're obviously going to be pivotal. Um, and they, Luckily, I, I don't feel they are all just like me kind of thing. Um, and um, 
but then then the other obviously they're in a situation and i have them in a situation i put them in a situation or the situation seems to appear i i, I never feel that i i sort of that in control of, of the, the way the way it develops that initial idea um and then other i know the kind of other people that they will be connected with and to and have been connected in the past and as tina says as you begin to write um, you, you, and especially when you edit you'll come back and go oh no 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 you wouldn't say that or you wouldn't do that you i mean sometimes you, you even as a pantser, not plotting that much ahead, you have ideas, sort of landmarks you're headed for. Um, and then suddenly, that person would never do that. I can't do it. You know, I have to find what they would actually do. You know, they're telling you, this is not this is not right. I'm sorry, but either you've got to get rid of me or change me completely or change the idea. So um, it, it is difficult. Um, it, I've changed from writing I don't know if I will continue doing this, but I've changed from writing in the first person to writing in the third person. Um, and uh, I find that's a bit easier um, to write in the third person, um, especially if you've got multiple narrators, but even where I have only one protagonist, I find it easier now to feel that distinction, it isn't me. You know, there isn't any of me even in the, the, the main character. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a finding out thing, a working through kind of thing, I think. James? Yeah, um, Mike, just where do characters come from? That's a good question. Um, I, I was talking to someone, uh, another author, and we were discussing a book that had just come out from an, by an author whom we both know. Uh, and I was interested interested by the questions she asked about the main character of the novel and she said do you know who it is and i thought what does she mean and i thought well actually i do know what she means because that character is andrew's first wife that's who she is yes that's who she, he's based her on but i don't do that i make them up you know so, so, some some people do actually uh, use people from real life and situations from real life. I like to make things up. At least I think I completely make them up. I can't completely make them up because you have to draw from life and there's a bit of this person, that person and the other. And uh, what I, I find is that I've got the person's characteristics worked out. I've got what it looks like worked out. But it's only when you get the voice of that character that he comes to life. When, when you know how that character is going to speak and move and act, then you have a character. And that's how I find it. So. so tell us about the locations from your books and why you've chosen them. Um, I know, James, you've touched on it slightly already, but let's go to Tina first. Uh, so my current work in progress um, is set on Tresco, the island of Tresco. I don't know if it'll come to anything, but that's where I met my husband. And I just speak after shielding and lockdown, I had to get out of my head and the house because everything else is domestic in the sense that the horror is right in your living room. It's right in your mind and your bed. Uh, so it's the opposite to James Bond. I always thought thriller and crime was, you know, jumping in helicopters and jumping out of helicopters and evil lairs and i i don't know about you guys but i've never been to an evil lair nobody's invited me uh so would you want to be invited don't to answer that. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so um call me mummy's very in the house like mummy mm. does you don't see mummy really outside very much because she's hiding a child in her house um, and the estate, again, I used to teach Zumba on the estate where the working class scummy mummy is based. And people judge, don't they, your locations and where you are. And nasty little putts is Muswell Hill, which is just up the road from where I live, uh, which is a very nice domestic setting. And it's like, 
what happens behind those lovely closed doors. I love walking around at dusk and nosing in other people's windows. I mean, not in the gardens, because that would be wrong, but, you know, not like a stalker. But I love observing those little scenes, you know, at night, at dusk, when the, when the clock... You're the reason I have my blinds closed all the time. <laughs> You see, I don't have curtains. This is this has caused in incidents because I don't have curtains at the back. I do have curtains in the bedroom, but you know, I sort of la 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 la, la and then there'll be somebody on my neighbour's roof doing the roofing, dive under the sofa because I've just come back from the gym. And anyway, uh, I've gone off again on one, haven't I? So I'd better shut up now. But yeah, very domestic settings usually. I think it's far more frightening when the horror is in your own kitchen and it's your husband with the knife and that's a nasty little cut. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think my, my settings, um, I'm not as, I mean, I'm not 100% sure about um, mine being called domestic noir. They've got quite a lot, especially as time has gone on, kind of a gothic -y thing. And, um, and then, but that what's domestic about them is that they're, they're not police. They're, they're, there's rarely any police involved. Um, there, there's a bit, and there's one main police character in one of the books. Um, but it's it's um, it, it's it's a, a group of people very closely entwined, always, and they they they're often related or they're they they I mean in in um, in the latest book they're all together in a house because they are a theatre group and one of them owns a house so they all read free and this is something that actually did happen to me they can live in that house together so it's like a, a you know hot house literally um so that it, that's the kind of sort of um close setting that i have um people working or living uh together very closely together um but i as, as far as sort of a bit more location um i always use um locations that i know sometimes very well sometimes um you know that they, they've been important to me in, in various ways um i haven't dared uh, and i don't really want to do something that's a long way away from my own experience you know um i know i, I love a, a, a writer called mary stewart she sort of went out right out of fashion she, she was, it was the 50s and 60s she was very very popular if you haven't read her she's brilliant um but she always did sort of fairly exotic things when tina was talking about the james bond hers were in, in you know just after the war i suppose and people wanted to get away so she used to do fairly exotic mm -hmm then like the south of france and greece and that kind of thing um and so i think somebody asked her so you know you know these places well how how, how often were you in say called who oh well i went one for a two-week holiday she said but you wouldn't believe that because she's obviously noting down everything you know but that not for me i want something that i i know more intimately um so it it, it tends to be my next one is set in the kind of place I, I live in now which is uh, a sandy bay in Kent so that's the next one that hasn't actually been published yet or isn't going to be published for a while yet so James right. well the present novel uh, where wolves prowl um it's set in Nairn which is where I live and how it came about was um well, the, the, uh, Nairn does actually have a high instance of, of, of sunshine for Scotland. It's, it's a sunny place, place in Scotland or right somewhere, uh, and which is very nice. And, and there are actually outdoor cafes on, on the, 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 the seaside front just off the beach in there. And um, it's, it, you know, it's very scenic there. You look out onto the Murray Firth and um, in the in the one outdoor cafe are nice leafy trees uh, and there's a passing green and um, I, I often go there just to, just on the middle of a walk to sit and relax and when I was sitting there I was imagining this group of people who were also going to this cafe 
and the, one of the major characters sort of appeared to me there and uh, that helped with the inspiration for the novel. Also, what interested me was along the shorefront, the, and the west end of, in the west end of Nairn is actually pretty posh. And we even have a film star lives in the old near Tilda Swinton. You may have heard of her. She is quite famous. And, and, uh, uh, so there are some posh houses there. And, and there are a couple of new modernist houses that have appeared there recently. Uh, and I was looking at these, and I, I, I just had a dream of a posh house owned by a film star, you know, with, with a, a pool, which was sort of, uh, you know, it could be outdoor when you wanted it, or you, you closed the, the glass doors and it was indoor, depending on the weather, because it's Scotland, you know. And uh, so I I had these characters that appeared to me uh, uh, at James Cathy, and I had the this house of the film star, and I had Jason coming from his working class to teacher background, and from a difficult fracture situation and he's trying to relax and start to look forward a bit more in life and he sees this group of people on the on the in the cafe on the, the shore and uh, he is invited to a pool party at the house of uh, this famous film star and um, uh, there's murder and mayhem of course things get worse for here you are <laughs> It's a novel. <laughs> as much as it'd be nice to have a pool to jump into today, I would not want to go to that house. Or that it's building. a beautiful house. <laughs> They've got Jackson Pollock on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's funny because I've been writing one, well, it's, and I've just finished it, that has a modernist house in. Because my previous one, the guest house, had a creepy old house. Yeah, and yeah. then I wanted one. They can still mm. be very frightening, can't they? Even mm -hmm. modernist, beautiful houses, you know, it doesn't have to be a hovel or a, or a creepy old mansion to be scary. Mm. I did like the house you created in the guest house. <laughs> yeah. Very much. <laughs> Good. Um, JP, who is author Jonathan Peace, um, he is exploring the reasons why certain authors write certain stories for a possible PhD. Why do you write what you write? I can't show you JP's books because they're on my Kindle, but um, fabulous, fabulous. I need to look, yeah, look him up. And he's just sent book three off to his publisher as well, which congratulations. Um, so why do you write what you write? So let's go to you, Tina. You kind of have touched on this a little bit, but. Yeah, it's, um, it is weird because it won't leave me alone. So I came to writing very late, as in I was a journalist, but I've always wanted to write novels. And it was giving myself permission. It wasn't until both my mum and dad had died that I'd almost given myself permission to do it. Because um, from my background, it was not exactly looked down on, but it was like, how are you going to earn a living? Uh, like even when I did English A-level, they persuaded me at one point, don't do English A-level because you need a proper job, do sciences. And I failed miserably at the sciences and ended up doing English anyway. And there was arguments about me doing English at university because, oh, what are you going to do? Now, like Chris and James, this will incense you. My dad, who was a window cleaner, used to say, them who do, do, and them who can't, teach. Absolutely. Which is, you know, outrageous. My brother's, uh, you know, was a teacher all his life as well. And they were trying to put me off teaching it's outrageous really when you think of it so those internalized voices stopped me writing for years and years and i'm quite glad it did in a way because like as james says you need a bit of life experience under your belt and for me it was learning to survive which sounds a bit i will survive but you know it was a bit of overcoming some of the really dark times so i write noir because i dress like my little pony but my heart is noir. <laughs> and I wanted to tackle things with humour. So gallows humour is why I write what I write, which sounds, you know, the stories change. So I've written, you know, four or five books now, two are published, another two are going to be published. The stories change, but the heart of them is how you survive stuff and how humour can be the lifeline. 
So whatever I'm writing, I try and have some cold black humor in there. Um, and that's, I suppose, the only, only common thing, apart from me being very common, the only common thing I can see through all the novels of why I'm writing those stories is horrible things that have happened to me or my friends or people I know. But also, to, there's something satisfying in writing that life's not like that. Life's, you know, never tied up neatly. And I hope I don't do a disservice to anybody's novels who are tied up neatly. But even by the process of writing, you're going to put some more order on things as opposed to the terror of like life, which is so random, if that makes sense. So I know that's a bit of an existential answer, but yeah, the nux of it for me is using all, oh God, I'm sorry, this sounds a bit um, embarrassing for me to admit. So it's like um, any pain that you write about, it becomes like art. Um, so it's using pain and life experiences with a good old dollop of humor to make good stories. Brilliant answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, was so busy. I was so thinking about what you said. <laughs> I was in a world of my own there, <laughs> or a world of your own. Anyway, <laughs> um, well, well um, partly because um, I'm absolutely, I'm sure, like all of us, a voracious reader myself. And so I kind of write the stories I kind of like to read you know and, and have done uh, so in some ways I think of my stories as being a bit old-fashioned you know sort of I'm um, influenced by Daphne du Maurier of course the Queen um, Ruth Rendell as Barbara Vine particularly those kind of people um, and also as I say like Mary Stewart and, and people like that um, but I think um, as far as my own self and why I write that kind of thing um, I mean I was brought, brought up Catholic, so I had this huge weight of guilt. I feel guilty about everything. I, I never did anything right. Um, I, I, I like you do that three o'clock in the morning thing is the regrets of things I did years ago, tiny things, embarrassments, awful things. I think, and, and then I think that that isn't you didn't it didn't happen, you know, but it could have happened. Um, things I did with with my children, you know, that, that was what if what if why did I do that? You know, and I want to take it back. And so I think my characters are like that, all of them, even the ones who are, you know, totally innocent, they feel bad, they feel they have, and, and that's why, because I think um, in my books, I hope everybody could be the baddie, but I don't think of them as baddie. I never think of my uh, last, uh, my, my villains as as villains they are people who got themselves into this position they were desperate to get out of it sometimes to avoid people knowing something they've done that they are sh totally ashamed of um i just i was at a, a conference once and, and i was talking to some other writers other i think there were three other writers and i said to them you know can you you know do you imagine yourself as as, as a villain do you, do you ever imagine yourself as villain uh, if you're in any book? And they all three said, oh, no, no. I, go, oh, gosh. I, I always feel, feel terrible for the villain, for the baddies. And I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I, I can very much feel, I never have anyone who does, I haven't had a serial, I had people who kill more than one person. And if you kill three, apparently that's a serial killer. But, um, yeah. They didn't intend to. It led on. It got carried away, and it was to try and hide that guilt. You know, I haven't killed anyone. I promise, um, and I never intend to. But I, you know, this weight of guilt is is here. And, you know, maybe it's a way of exercising that, as, as kind of like you were saying, Tina. Um, I'm quite a cheerful person, really. <laughs> James. Right. Okay. Uh, no. <clears throat> Why do I write certain stories? Well, I think different novels can come from different sources, actually, within yourself even. Um, a, uh, often you're not, I think, aware 
of what that source is and why you're writing the novel until later on. Uh, and it was when I was talking to my publisher who was writing an article about me um, and he was doing an in-depth interview with me for it. And uh, it was only then that I realized why I'd written the first novel I'd written. And, and what happens in the body under the sands is, is we have uh, some soldiers who come back from the First World War, which was a horrible experience. And everybody is trying to, to cope uh, with their memories, what they've gone through in that, that terrible time. I mean, the whole fabric, fabric of society was changed because it was changed from a peacetime economy to a wartime economy. And we've been doing lots of jobs that men used to do and, and men going off to war and fighting. And, uh, and the, the battlefield, it was, it was terrible because the, the, the war technology was at a certain stage where um, they had you know, machine guns, shells, which were devastating in their effect. And um, so the defensive weapons were very highly advanced, but the offensive weapons were not so well advanced. So what you had was you, you had trench warfare where they were stuck in trenches and you couldn't get across no man's land to attack the trench across because of all the machine guns and shells. Uh, uh, but it's war, you're supposed to go and attack the enemy. So, you know, there, was, there were advances, there was the Battle of the Somme, there was wipers. And when you read the experiences that these uh, young men were going through, uh, they had terrible difficulty in coming to terms with the fact that so many of the men they fought with died. I mean, you'd have a whole company with only a few men left because you'd advanced at the Somme and these machine guns and had wiped out everybody. Uh, and it, you can have a situation where it's like a, a scythe in a, in a field of, of corn. The, 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 the scythe cuts the corn, but it leaves one standing. And that can happen. Your machine gun wipes out everybody and you're left, you're standing, and you don't understand why you're still alive. Uh, but the dreadful thing is coming to terms with where people have gone, because you can't... Uh, uh, come to terms with the fact that you knew all these people, you, 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 you laughed with them, you shared fun, difficult experiences. Where did they go? Well, they can't just have disappeared. They must still be somewhere out there. And you can't come to terms with the fact that they're dead. And that's why there was such an, a growth in spiritualism uh, between the wars, because people were trying to get in touch with, with the dead because they, they, had, they couldn't comprehend the fact they were dead. They had is still somewhere that you could talk to. And it was only when I was talking to my publisher that I realized why this question of how do you come to terms with death? I realized why I was so interested in that. It was because my, my wife actually died of cancer. And this was part of where the wellspring of emotion that, that it brought me to write the book came from. So, yes, uh, you, you, I thought story just came from uh, articles that I'd read in newspapers. I know it also come from me. So we're not always aware at the time of why we write certain stories. Three wonderful answers. Um, I hope that's helpful, JP. I feel like you've got a lot out of that. Um, we have only got about eight minutes left. So I'm going to ask you all your memorable moments so far as an author. So starting with Tina. Uh, Bloody Scotland, which was the first. Um, I wonder game. where you were going when you started talking then. So, yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, none of it felt real until that moment. So um, I, I was so touched by what you were saying, James, because, you know, it was only after my mum and dad died that I addressed my grief about not having a baby, really. I mean, I could talk about it. Um, and it's so internal and so intimate. Um, and I'd spent years writing. I'd gone on this MA at City University. You know, people had seen bits of it, but, you know, that was a different novel. And then I built up and built up, and it was like, finally, I was going to get published. And then there was a pandemic. And one of my jobs was teaching Keep Fit to Vulnerable People. 
loads of them died. You know, they're all pensioners, people in wheelchairs, people in, you know, um, homes and stuff. So it was like all of that. My writing seemed such a, a small thing in the middle of all of that. And none of it felt real. And on the day it was published, none of the bookshops were open. And it was just like, oh, what's, you know, but actually the second book, um, you know, it was the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And, and, you know, I thought, well, I might as well go home now. You know, there's no point. But there was this moment, a brief moment in all of this. So I suffer quite badly from anxiety and depression. You know, I'm on drugs for it. I had to have hypnotherapy to get down the co-op after shielding. And then suddenly I'd gone down the co-op once and I was on a train for six hours to come up to Scotland. God bless Scotland. And I was suddenly on stage in front of it seemed like thousands of people, probably a couple of dozen, uh, for my three minutes of reading from Call Me Mummy. And I dressed as a bumblebee just because <laughs> And I met lovely people like Donna, who's here. And it just felt suddenly like I get really emotional to say the words, I'm an author, because I'd never said that, even in my passport. It, it was like a journalist rather than writer. And then it was keep fit professional stroke writer. And like to just say out loud, I'm an author and be accepted as an author, albeit dressed as a bumblebee. And the reason for that was I was in the Killer Bee session at Bloody Scotland with Chris Meyer and uh, somebody else whose name has gone because, you know, I'm very old. Uh, who's the other bee? The other bee, I was on Chris Brookmeyer and the other one, she'll type it in because she knows that. Um, and it was just literally three minutes on stage and, it, and something went in my brain. It was like, yeah, I'm a writer. I'm a proper writer. I'm a published author. So there you go. Bee costumes um, are optional for writers, I feel. I don't know. I feel like they shouldn't be optional. I feel like we all need a day as a bee. Absolutely. Maybe not today. <laughs> Maybe when, when it cools down a bit. I'm always too hot in winter, though, so you can imagine how uncomfortable I am now. Um, Chris, tell us about your memorable moments. Oh, gosh, quite a lot, actually. Um, luckily, I uh, was first published in 2015, so it was before the the pandemic so things were happening which was lovely um i did a bloody scotland that it was wonderful um, i love sterling i love you know that was great on stage as you say um i suppose it was when my first book was accepted for publication because i'd been you know i'd been writing for years i've been trying to write novels as well as stories and um i had that that, that book which was mine site my first book had been, <laughs> been rejected quite a lot of time, but also a lot of people liked it, but I didn't think it was going to get anywhere. And then I heard um, HarperCollins was interested. And I was I was sitting at my laptop, actually, and got this email. And, um, and my husband came into the room, or was sort of wandering back and forth, I think. And I said, now, don't get too excited. I think HarperCollins mm -hmm. wants to publish the book of course he was terribly excited in fact the next thing i did we'd run out to go and buy a bottle of champagne at the off license uh, but i was going now this is not going to work it, 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 this editor saying she loves my book mm -hmm. no it must be a scam perhaps you know and, and but that that was has to be the highlight you know the first and the first launch of course but yeah i think that was probably the highlight so far when i get number one on the new york times bestseller list that will be overtaken <laughs> james Is it all, i think we, we all of us suffer a bit from imposter syndrome you know um, whether we say so or not i think most people do um yeah my most memorable moments as a writer was simply when the first book arrived you know it was so lovely to to actually see it in print and uh, I loved the, the illustration at the front because we have a 1920s young lady walking into a beach. And she, she's, she's fairly carefree, young, prissy, a little life ahead of her. But that is the beach she dies on. And that, to me, is the central image of the book. It's actually based on a real story, you know, a real murder. 
and I feel so for that young woman. So uh, just getting a book published was just yeah. music for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone is it. <coughs> Absolutely brilliant. We've got two minutes left. So do you all just want to show your book covers and tell everybody where they can buy them from? So let's go round and round the same way again. Tina, go first. Very careful uh, how you say it. Yeah, Nasty Little Cups is out on the Kindles and the audios and Amazons and Waterstones. And the paperback's coming to you as Dursey, Double H Smith, and Call Me Mommy, <coughs> paperback in all those places. And it's something that Jane says, it's holding your books for the first time. <laughs> your book favourites. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, so this one, uh, when the lights um, go out, sorry, I, it's new to me too, the title, um, is coming out on December the 2nd, I think, in December the yeah, December the second, maybe December the first for the paperback, but it's available to pre-order now, and it's very, very cheap. It might go up in price, so you know, pre-order. Um, before that, it was the Guest House by Abby Frost, so I am Abby Frost as well. So if you liked Abby Frost, don't forget I'm also Chris Curran because that's Chris Curran. <laughs> but somebody said they didn't know until I. Uh, I was on here, I think, the last introductory time. So that's me. James. Well, this is the, the latest book, Where Wolves Prowl, which is available on Kindle and in paperback from Amazon and uh, local bookshops here. Um, so that is the book. Do you want to show us the others as well? Sorry? Do you want to show us some others? Right. Burning Suspicion was the one before that, which is also sitting there. And again, that's that's in kin available on Kindle and from Amazon. And, uh, a, and there's The Body Under the Sands. A Death Waits for No Lady, the second volume in the Inspector Blade series. And uh, there's The Riddle of the Dunes, uh, which is the third in the, that series. And the suitcase Thank you all so much. Thank you to everybody who's joined in and asked brilliant questions. Really yeah, lovely to the members and authors come and support other authors, so we always appreciate it. Um, JP's just been um, and ordered all of your first books, so there you go. Worthwhile listening to me waffle for an hour. And thank you all so much. What a brilliant hour. And um, Really grateful that you all agreed to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. We want Thank to soak our feet in ice cubes now. <laughs> it looks a bit cloudier outside. I'm yep. just going to find somewhere to sit and pour some water yep. on my head. The storms are coming, just as in our five, five, miles, five miles outside, near, and the sun is shining. I'm told it was yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.